Okay. Welcome to the Duty to Warn vidcast. Uh, I'm your host, John Gartner, and we're very lucky today to have Dr. James Gilligan. Uh, Dr. Gilligan is a clinical professor of psychiatry at NYU Medical School, and for the past 30 plus years, he has specialized in researching, writing about, and uh, treating issues related to violence and dangerousness. Um, he has run a variety of programs for offenders. He has um, advised various politicians and heads of state. And I have to say that I was lucky enough to hear Dr. Gilligan at Yale University at our Duty to Warn meeting, and I was uh, extremely impressed. Well, Dr. Gilligan, you have um, actually taken an interesting approach, which is to say the issue is not Donald Trump's mental illness, not his diagnosis. The issue is one of dangerousness. And as you've pointed out, uh, and I'm quoting your paper here, uh, he has evidenced threats, boasts, and incitements to violence. Uh, you cite seven examples, which I'll just quickly mention here. Uh, one is um, saying, what's the use of having nuclear weapons if you can't use them? Uh, advocating torture, advocating the death penalty for the Central Park Five who had been vindicated already, boasting about sexual assault, urging violence against protesters, wanting to lock up his opponent, um, and saying I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and nobody would uh, do anything about it. So that's quite a list. Would you like to elaborate more about uh, that issue? Yes, first of all, the reason I said that uh, I thought uh, the issue was really dangerousness, not mental illness, is not to say that Trump may not meet the diagnostic criteria for several different mental disorders listed in the American Psychiatric Association's uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, but I'm saying that's simply not really relevant to the issue I'm trying to raise here, because dangerousness is a separate uh, concept from mental illness. Uh, a person can be mentally ill and not dangerous, and a person can be dangerous but not mentally ill. So in some ways, it doesn't really matter whether Trump is mentally ill or not. What matters in terms of the, the public health uh, and preventive uh, psychiatry is whether he's dangerous. Now, most mentally ill people are not particularly dangerous. Uh, people who commit a criminal homicide in America or a murder, um, only about 1% are determined by the courts and the forensic psychiatrists who evaluate them to be mentally ill, that is, not guilty by reason of insanity. So therefore, if they're not mentally ill, they're regarded as mentally healthy. Um, they may have a character disorder, as we call it, but uh, that does constitute a major mental illness according to the legal criteria of mental illness. So uh, I'm saying that uh, most of the people who commit serious violence are not regarded as mentally ill the way we diagnose major mental illnesses in this country for legal and psychiatric purposes. But I have specialized in studying dangerousness and I, I listed only uh, seven reasons for concluding that Trump is a danger to the public health. Uh, there are many more that could be listed, but I thought these were the main ones. Uh, the first and most serious uh, is, is the one you mentioned first, his attitude toward thermonuclear weapons. I mean, this is in, this is insane, except that uh, uh, that's not necessarily making a diagnostic judgment about him. I'm talking about the, the reasoning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the whole purpose of having these weapons is precisely so they won't be used by anybody. Uh, people can debate whether that's wise or not. But the idea that uh, that uh, we need to say, why can't we use them? Like in, in response to an attack by ISIS. I mean, that's that's really uh, talk about dangerousness. That's more dangerous than any president we have ever had in our history. Um, the second most dangerous uh, thing that that he said, and he said this publicly. Nobody doubts that he said it, it's been recorded and uh, replayed many times, uh, is he commented that his followers could always assassinate Hillary Clinton. 
Now, he didn't use the word assassinate. He, he spoke uh, in his customary way, indirectly, to give himself what they call plausible deniability. But what he said was uh, that the Second Amendment, folks, he said that if Hillary Clinton gets elected, there's nothing we can do about uh, uh, her capacity to nominate judges, especially Supreme Court judges that uh, uh, he might not like. But uh, he said, but then he said, well, but perhaps the Second Amendment folks could, meaning, obviously, gun owners and gun fanciers. Uh, now, how could they stop her from uh, nominating Supreme Court judges? Obviously, there's only one way. That would be to shoot her. Uh, so what that reminded me of as an incitement to violence is a very famous uh, historical example, although there are many of them, but I'd say one of the best is a story about the English king, Henry II, in the Middle Ages, who uh, incited his knights to assassinate the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, who will Thomas rid me Beckett, of this meddlesome the, priest? The, the, yes, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? He that didn't order them the to Comey do it. the Comey hearings yesterday, by the way. I just <laughs> yes, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I quoted it in my, in my paper. I know you did. The Yale Conference. No, that's, the, that's an obvious, I think, example a good one. of how somebody can incite people to violence, uh, encourage them to really assassinate his political rival, Hillary Clinton, without uh, a formally giving an order to do so. Now, Trump is still playing that same game uh, with Comey when he talked about, uh, or let's say when Trump's supporters say, well, he didn't really order Comey to shut down a criminal investigation, which might have led directly to Trump himself, um, but rather that he uh, uh, said he hoped that uh, Comey would shut down that investigation, make it go away, you know, lay off. Um, the, the idea that somebody could claim that he was not, in effect, ordering Comey to uh, drop the investigation that might lead directly to Trump himself uh, is, is so absurd. It's hard to believe that anybody could make such a statement with a straight face. I mean, how, how dumb do they think the voters are? Uh, anybody can understand what Trump meant and what he was saying. If you understand the English language, you understand what he was saying. Yeah. As uh, Kamala Harris, the senator from California, put it, if an armed robber points a gun at you and says, I hope you'll give me your wallet, the word hope uh, <laughs> has a different meaning from what it does in ordinary conversation. And I hope you want to And if you're the job. president of the United States, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I hope you'll do this so I won't have to fire you. <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, the level of, of game playing here is, is, is just be off the scale. Yeah, yeah. So this is an excellent point. So th those are some of the reasons that I talked I just said you I pointed to his dangerousness. You mentioned uh, several others. The fact that he is uh, uh, actually specifically has encouraged uh, his followers to beat up people. Uh, who are protesting at, uh, at his political rallies. Yeah. Um, and that they then have done that. Uh, you know, he's urged them to punch people in the face and beat them up so badly they'll have to be taken out on stretchers. Uh, and, uh, and then complains that they weren't being violent enough. Um, I mean, if that's not incitement to violence, then nothing is an incitement to violence. Mm. And if that, if incitements to violence are not what is meant by the term dangerousness, then I don't know what is. So, so that's that's where I'm coming from. So, despite all of these uh, warning signs uh, of dangerousness, uh, the American Psychiatric Association has tried to gag all psychiatrists from saying anything, uh, not only about his diagnosis, but making any comments. They've broadened Goldwater to mean that we shouldn't uh, make any comments about uh, public figures at all, including their dangerousness. In your paper, you compare the American Psychiatric Association of today to the German Psychiatric Association of the 1930s. Could you say more about that? 
Yes. Uh, I'm saying that it does no honor or credit to the German Psychiatric Association in the 1930s that they did not speak out specifically uh, against Adolf Hitler uh, during his rise to power. Um, I would say that there, the silence of, uh, in fact, a, a whole range of major um, German professional associations during that time uh, really passively enabled uh, an, an obvious psychopath like Hitler to come to power uh, and, uh, you know, lead to the worst chapter in the history of Germany or practically any other country on earth. Um, and I'm saying it's important that we not make the same mistake. Um, and as I said, the, 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 uh, the Goldwater rule in America, as, as you know, was uh, put in place during the, or actually after the uh, presidential uh, candidacy of Barry Goldwater in 1968, um, during which uh, hundreds of psychiatrists signed a, an open letter or article saying that they did not think he was mentally fit to be president, um, or words to that effect. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association said that uh, psychiatrists should not uh, offer an opinion as to somebody's uh, diagnosis or mental illness if they hadn't personally examined the person and also received his permission to make their conclusions public. Now, uh, there is, however, another legal route called the Terracell decision. This is a decision that was handed down by a court in California, but it really has standing throughout the country, that uh, gives psychiatrists a positive duty to speak out if they have reason to believe that a person is dangerous uh, to other, other people, and uh, to warn the person or people uh, that he appears to them to be dangerous to, whether or not he gives them permission. To, uh, to express those opinions. Uh, in other words, in that situation, a psychiatrist does not have the, the right, the moral or legal right, to remain silent. And I'm saying that's the situation we're in with Donald Trump. Uh, I'd say the Tarasov decision trumps the Goldwater rule. Um, and I have devoted my life to studying uh, the... Uh, causes and prevention of violence, including predictions of dangerousness. I, I've had to do this. I've had uh, administrative responsibilities to determine when uh, somebody is, is or is not ready to leave a, uh, a mental hospital, for example, in which they've been committed uh, uh, because they're a judge to be dangerous to self or others by reason of mental illness. Uh, but I've also worked with people in regular prisons and jails, most of whom are not diagnosable as mentally ill, but certainly are, 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 are dangerous. Uh, and uh, it's clear that, uh, that Trump, to me, I think it's just, in fact, indisputable that he has made uh, uh, incitements to violence. Uh, he has posted about violence that he himself has committed. Uh, I made the point that he, when he talked about sexually assaulting women, he didn't confess that he had done that. He boasted about it. In other words, he didn't feel the slightest uh, scintilla of guilt or remorse at having uh, humiliated women and and uh, robbed them of their, their dignity as human beings in this way. Uh, on the contrary, he boasted about the fact because he was so powerful, because of his celebrity, that he could get away with it. He said, you could do anything when you're a star. Uh, grab him by the pussy. Uh, and uh, on and on. Now, if that is not sexual assault, then, then nothing is. Um, and uh, that's, not, that's not a question of, uh, of, you know, having to interview somebody in private he said this publicly. 
all I'm doing is hearing what he said. And what I'm saying is that it would be, I think, irresponsible to act as if I were deaf. I'm not deaf. I mean, I, I can I can hear these words being spoken. Well, <laughs> uh, not, on not, only, not only are you not deaf, but you've been an expert in this field for over 30 years. And what you're saying is that you feel you owe the public a duty to bring your expertise and your experience to bear in warning them about what these signs of violence and dangerousness might mean. But the American Psychiatric Association doesn't agree with you about that. In fact, they don't seem to feel that you you said in your writing, we owe society a primary duty. That's not the American Psychiatric Association's position. Well, that's where I'd have to say I, I disagree with them. Because I think psychiatry, like all medical specialties, uh, is not just a, a, a specialty in clinical medicine. It also is part of a, of a larger project of public health and preventive medicine. Uh, and that gives us a duty to society as a whole. Um, people in preventive medicine uh, generally uh, speak of three levels of of prevention of illness and death. Um, the most important and the most effective uh, is uh, the most powerful is primary prevention, uh, which um, may have little or nothing to do with doctors or hospitals or treatments. Uh, in medicine, the most powerful primary uh, primary prevention of communicable diseases might be cleaning up the water supply in the sewer system. It has nothing to do with doctors, but it's more effective than anything doctors can do. Uh, it's the most important thing to do. I'm saying if we want to prevent violence, the most important thing we can do is to clean up the political system when somebody is there who is dangerous to the public in the same way that the color of bacillus is dangerous if it is in the water supply that people are drinking from. So that's what I'm trying to warn people about, uh, that Trump is as dangerous as the color of bacillus. He's not a bacillus, he's a human being. But uh, he's just as tough. both color of bacilli and human beings can kill people. And that, that's what we need to be concerned about. Well, that's very well put. Or they can lead people to kill other people. Yeah, the most dangerous people actually are not the people who kill people themselves. They are people who induce other people to kill people. Hitler and Stalin may never have killed anybody themselves. I don't know that they ever committed a murder, either of them. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But whatever they did as individuals pales in comparison with the degree to which they unleashed violence uh, in their followers and, the, and by inciting them to violence. And uh, that's exactly what, what Trump has done. Now, as far as what the American Psychiatric Association is uh, talking about, um, clinical psychiatry is, is not primary prevention. It's not even secondary prevention. Uh, secondary prevention is treating people who are at higher than average risk of an illness, but before they've actually gotten ill. The way in medicine, we, uh, if somebody has a high cholesterol level, we give them uh, pills to, to lower the cholesterol level. Or if they have high blood pressure, uh, we give them pills to lower the high blood pressure before they have a stroke or a heart attack. Um, but clinical psychiatry, like all of clinical medicine, is tertiary prevention. That's the treatment you offer only after people have already become sick. So that is really the least useful uh, forum in which we psychiatrists or any other physicians uh, can exercise our profession. Yes, we need to do that because primary and secondary prevention, you know, are never 100% successful. People do get sick anyway. So we do have to treat them. But that is the least important and the least valuable thing that we as psychiatrists bring to the public health. Uh, so that's why I'm saying, that, yes, when we're treating an individual, our primary responsibility, of course, is to that individual. But when we're talking about trying to prevent epidemics of life-threatening pathologies, whether they be cholera bacilli or thermonuclear weapons or the Second Amendment folks who have guns to assassinate their 
political rivals with. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about epidemics of violence. We're talking about a danger to the public health. And we're talking about the need for primary prevention of violence, not simply tertiary prevention. So the German Psychiatric Association did itself no credit in retrospect. It's ironic to me that the American Psychiatric Association, one of their justifications for the Goldwater Rule is that they don't want anyone to embarrass the profession of psychiatry. But what will the reputation of psychiatry look like 20, 30 years from now if there is a thermonuclear war and they enabled the rise of this catastrophe through their silence? Well, that is exactly my point. Um, that the, the, the important thing with, I think, with Donald Trump is that it's time that we stopped acting as if he was simply a normal politician or a normal political leader. He's not normal. Uh, and I mean that in the, in the statistical sense, you can argue over the, if you mean it in the medical sense, mm -hmm. one could make that argument. But that's not relevant to what I'm saying here. I'm saying that he is unprecedentedly um, untrustworthy He's made it very clear that he, that he either has no respect for facts or doesn't recognize uh, the concept of, of factual, factual reality. Um, and again, you don't have to uh, you don't have to interview him privately to conclude that because that's not really the issue. Uh, it's not the question of whether he believes the thing he's things he's saying. What I'm saying is that the statements and, and the, these innumerable middle-of-the-night tweets that Donald Trump sends out constantly, whether or not he believes what he's saying, uh, or maybe whether he's, he may be sane enough to be, you know, fiendishly uh, brilliant at knowing how to manipulate and deceive the public, so maybe that he knows that most of what he says is nonsense, if you believe in factual reality. Um, but that's not the issue. The issue is what effect does this have on the millions of his followers? Again, it's like Hitler and Stalin. It doesn't quite even matter what was going on in their minds because they didn't commit. They didn't personally do the things that nevertheless have led, to, led us to say that they were among the most dangerous political leaders in the 20th century. In fact, in almost any century. Um, so, so it's not a question of what's going on in Trump's mind. It's a question of the effect that his statements have on millions of other people uh, who hear what he's saying and what they hear, they act on. So that, for example, many of his followers, or at least a number of them, at his political rallies have in fact uh, followed his recommendations and physically assaulted, committed assault and battery against people who disagreed with, uh, with, with Donald Trump. Uh, and when they were, uh, had to stand trial for assault and battery after doing this, they commented. They were just doing what he told them to do. They're innocent which was by reason of Trumpism? <laughs> yes, right. It's about what it amounts to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so and that's, also the, that's... the rise in hate crimes. I think you're. This is also part of what you're talking about. There's been an extraordinary rise yeah. in hate crimes. There's been a um, suddenly a spree of swastika, you know, spray painting all over the country. I mean, it's not just the, what you read about in the newspaper. I've heard from half a dozen people, a friend at Cornell, uh, a friend uh, near her synagogue. I mean, the, we, we can't count the number of swastikas that are being spray painted all over the country, but it's a phenomenon that's breaking out. Yes, uh, and that is, that is profoundly true. Um, and it, uh, it's an example of what I, what, what I mean when I talk about the uh, the the, the, the uh, scatter effects, the the uh, uh, the fact that when Trump says something, it reaches millions of people uh, who are likely to act on them. What this reminds me of is a um, 
a marvelous statement that the late Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis made when he talked about why it was so important for uh, government officials uh, not to break the law. He said that the government is the, is the teacher of the public. The government sets the example for how people should behave in society at large. And if government officials break uh, the rules, break the laws, they're really giving an example and giving permission to the public to break the laws. That leads to the breakdown of the rule of law itself, the, the basis of our whole civilization. And what I'm saying is there's something analogous to that here. Uh, it's important for government officials not to uh, incite violence, not to recommend violence, not to threaten violence, not to boast of their own violence. Because if they do that, they're, they're, they're you know, like parents with children. They're, they're teaching the public that that's the way to behave. And I think we see the results in what you just referred to, the, the uh, recent escalation of uh, hate crimes and, and, and so forth, uh, following this barrage of um, recommendations uh, for violence that have been uh, coming from the mouth of Donald J. Trump. So he's a threat to our democracy. Uh, he's a threat to our way of life. He's a threat to our lives. He's a threat to our rule of law. But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how'd you like the play? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's, there's not much you can say that he hasn't uh, violated. Uh, that, that I think anybody... That show me a care. norm or law he hasn't violated, right? <laughs> That's right. He's never met a norm uh -huh. he didn't like to violate. <laughs> right. No, I think that what is really so important here is that the, the you know, no psychiatrist uh, and no member of any other profession ordinarily feels a need to speak out in these terms about political leaders. Uh, I mean, yes, we, we, uh, there are far more than we would like who have uh, behaved in ways that have appalled many people. But nevertheless, most of the time, um, you don't feel the need to make the kind of warnings uh, that I and many, many other people are making here. Look, I, I'm, I'm only one of many, many people who uh, are, are trying to warn the public about how dangerous Trump is. Um, but I think that uh, it's important to recognize he is an exception. He is not a normal politician. Ironically, that may be one reason why many people voted for him. Uh, they, they were tired of the shortcomings uh, of, uh, of many normal politicians. Uh, the problem is that electing him, I think, whether or not that was the intention of those who voted for him, I think the effect of voting for him has been uh, to unleash a kind of nihilism I mean, a, a, a real breakdown of the the basic assumptions right. and uh, uh, beliefs that that underlie our, our whole civilization: the rule of law, the separation of powers between the executive branch and the uh, legislative and judicial branches, uh, the undermining of the judici judiciary, uh, the attack on the freedom of the press claiming that the press is the enemy of the people, mm -hmm. and threatening to uh, start changing the laws about libel so that he could put journalists in prison if they write things that he uh, disagrees with. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, there's so many things he's done in this Can I, can I just read one quote from you that I, I thought uh, I wanted to uh, discuss related to this? You said, Trump is now the most powerful politician in the world, as well as the most impulsive, Arrogant, ignorant, disorganized, nihilistic, chaotic, and self-serving. Now, come on, tell us what you really think about this guy. <laughs> well, believe me, that's only a partial list. <laughs> you were going easy on him there, huh? I was going easy on him. Yeah. 
All right. Well, Dr. Gilligan, I'm so grateful to you for this interview. I, I think this is really very valuable uh, stuff. And I'm going to ask you, take a risk and ask you on air to be one of the speakers at our New York rally on October 14th. I don't know if you knew we're having a duty to warn meeting on October 14th, but I would just like to extend an offer to you to, to speak because I think what you have to say is extremely valuable. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'd be very, very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to yeah. You're welcome. And thanks for talking to me today. I'll send you a copy of this later. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Take care. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.